Greetings everyone, welcome to the lecture on gender and autobiography. Presently we are discussing the life of Haimavati Sen as it emerges from her autobiography. Negotiating and resisting patriarchy for Haimavati was through the means of higher education, the desire for which she pointed out has persisted throughout my life. The passion for studying had been instilled in her early childhood years when she had picked up the letters while playing with her male cousins and attending their lessons in the outer courtyard of their house. So we see here was a woman who never got an opportunity to get enrolled in a school per se, but she kind of picked up letters from her cousins who had this opportunity to get formally educated. Later, her father even allowed her to be taught by a teacher despite protests from, from female family members including her mother and grandmother. So therefore, we see that here was a girl who had a desire to get educated despite all the odds. A burning passion for learning became the driving force of her life and this also kind of gave her so much confidence that very often she would take very bold decisions. So after she had settled down at Banaras, she decided to plunge out of Banaras and go to the unknown city of Calcutta because it was in Calcutta that she visualized that she would be able to have access to education which was not possible in Banaras. So, she took help of a distant male relative and she left Banaras and reached Calcutta where all major Brahmo educationists were located. And now we see that a process started of her becoming an independent woman. She contacted some of the famous educationists and reformers and also took refuge in one of the several widows homes that were set up at Calcutta by re reformers and tried to gain education over there. This journey however bore no fruit since she found in Calcutta that the famous educationists were busy preparing their uh, preparing to leave for England and they were more interested in carrying on with their own career prospects rather than encouraging or helping women like Haimabati who needed some kind of help. However, Haimabati did not lose hope and she set out for rural East Bengal, but not to her brother's house. Instead, she sought out independent employment, working as a teacher to the wife of a zamidar. Hema Bhati's leaving Benares was also a quest for an identity, a mission to carve out an independent identity for herself which was largely based on ideas of financial independence as well as self-reliance. She sought financial independence first as a widow and later on also as a remarried woman because even after marrying she continued with her profession. Now the next part of autobiography deals with her journey from widow remarriage to domesticity. While widow remarriage had been legalized in 1856, in reality, however, it rarely took place among upper caste Hindus. Hema Bhati's memoir also shows that how widow remarriage, though legalized, continued to be problematic for women. 
In 19th century Bengal, the cause of women, especially of widows, came to be largely associated with Brahmo Samaj. Brahmo Samaj encouraged schools for girls as well as the setting up of widows' homes where widows were provided shelter and imparted some kind of training. A very interesting observation that has been made by Meredith Brothwick that the Brahmo Samaj and also Christianity held out hope for widows by waiving all the usual restrictions imposed upon them. Many widows escaped from their village homes to join a Brahmo community in one of the district towns uh, or in, at some, in some place uh, in Calcutta. And probably this was the reason why Hemabati was also kind of attracted to Calcutta. There were records of a number of widows and kulin brides who were attracted to the Brahmo Samaj. Once they had joined, provisions were made for their education, for their vocational training and sometimes also for their remarriage. So, Haimavati became a Brahmo by her own choice and this also had its own gender dynamics. Conversion to Christianity or to the Brahmo Samaj was a feature that was associated with a great deal of what was being championed as rights of women. However, this is not to assume that all Brahmo Samaj families were forward thinking. Unspoken prejudices still persisted against marrying adult widows, thereby revealing a gap between practice and perception. For example, in the case of a pregnant young widow named Tara, her Brahmo lover's parents who were in charge of a widow's home fiercely opposed their marriage even though they themselves had undergone a widow remarriage and there were a number of such examples. Now, it was at this point of time that Haima Bhati started thinking again in terms of getting some kind of male protection. So, wandering alone across the countryside, Haima Bhati's friends and well-wishers urged her to get remarried so that she could have some kind of male protection as has been mentioned in her autobiography. She received four arranged marriage proposals from Brahmo Samajis, but none of these worked out for different reasons. Eventually, her marriage was arranged in 1890 to Kunja Bihari Sen, who was a Brahmo Samaj worker at the age of 25. Again, difficult marriage and irresponsible husband. These are some of the facts that uh, were mentioned time and again in her autobiography. Due to her husband's impractical and eccentric ways, they led a very uh, disrupted, nomadic and dysfunctional life for a long time. There was no steady income. Even after five children, four sons and one daughter had been born. So, as she has mentioned in autobiography, my debts were quite substantial by now. My husband was not worried about anything. All the worries were mine. So, it was at this point of time that there was need all the more for financial independence. And it is then that she realized that she needed to pick up a career uh, and especially medical training to earn an independent income. Many girls had joined medical schools at that time and Hema Bhati has written that she also decided to do the same. 
the medical profession was one of the earliest professions that Indian women entered, especially from 1880s onwards, as has also, also been mentioned by the scholar Geraldine Forbes. <coughs> so, medical training for women had long been available, uh, western medical training especially had long been available to Indian males, but it was not until 1885 that Lady Dufferin uh, established the National Association for Supplying Female Medical Aid to Women of India or this was also known as the Dufferin Fund. It provided financial assistance to women who wanted to be trained as doctors, hospital assistants, nurses, midwives and it also helped in establishing medical training programs for women. It encouraged construction of hospitals, dispensaries and in Bengal, women could also earn a vernacular licentiate in medicine and surgery degree known as VLMS. The opening up of the Campbell Medical School in Calcutta to women students in 1888 marked a very important step in this direction. Even though there were hospital ast assistants rather than full-fledged doctors, women became the backbone of these small hospitals and dispensaries, staffing as many as 90 percent of these hospitals. Uh, so, therefore, this was a major step that was taken by the state and Hemabati took note of it. The VLMS degree prepared women with very little formal education to assist doctors. Although these women held inferior degrees, they were often put in charge of the hospitals that employed them. And the greatest advantage was that because they had grown up in Bengal, they also knew the local language and the, they had uh, association with uh, local people, local dialect and for, therefore they were very effective in home visits and consultations. Uh, however, here again there were a number of bottlenecks that were in her way. And Hema Bhati's autobiography speaks volumes about gender and patriarchy, gender implications of her education and patriarchal bottlenecks in medical college. Hema Bhati with a one year old child joined the Campbell Medical School in 1891 at the age of 26 along with a few other girls. Because she was very intelligent, she did extremely well and out of 4 females and 12 male students, she stood first in the examination and was awarded 2 scholarships for this. However, she encountered institutionalized gender discrimination. In final examinations, she had actually topped the class and qualified for the gold medal. But the boys in her college went on a strike in protest against her being awarded the gold medal. They formed groups, stopped attending classes, pelted the girl students, uh, a carriage with bricks and stones and even the general public supported the boys. There were a number of letters that were circulated in the newspapers which declared why do not we kill off that girl that would be the end of the matter. It is a great mistake to pamper women. So finally, the institution surrendered by and boys won the battle. They petitioned the inspector general and the lieutenant governor on this matter and the latter persuaded Hemabati who with characteristic pragmatism readily agreed to give up her gold medal and settle for silver medals instead. 
Hema Bhati was a practical woman who knew that she needed money and her only request was that she be given a monthly scholarship of rupees 30 instead which would enable her to attend lectures at the Calcutta Medical College. Now, uh, having experienced such discriminations time and again, the next part of her discussion was about her life as it was evolving at her home front. And here also she speaks about gender contradictions. Haima Bhati joined the Hugli Lady Dufferin Women's Hospital as a lady doctor on a pay of 50 rupees a month. With the job came free living quarters and she was also allowed to have a private medical practice alongside. She started to receive an income from the hospital as well as from her private practice, becoming the family's sole breadwinner. She also continued to perform the dual role of the male breadwinner by going out into the public world and earning money and also of the traditional female nurturing her children and home. The same woman who had displayed such independence throughout her life was suddenly showing unusual subservience at the home front. Like a docile good wife, she handed over all her earnings, starting with the money from her two scholarships during her medical school days. By casting herself in the traditional mold of a woman economically dependent on a husband, Haima Bhati created an imagined reality of economic dependence for herself. So therefore, what emerges is that though Hema Bhati displayed uh, extreme uh, confidence in herself that despite so many odds, she finally got herself educated and got an opportunity to earn a decent living. But because she was in the domestic realm, she continued to toe the traditional line. And she has written in her autobiography, I had to ask him if I needed even a single pice. I earned a lot at this time. I got three to four hundred rupees from my practice over and above my pay. So what does this indicate? This basically indicates that there were several contradictions uh, that were uh, that continue to exist despite women gaining access to education, gaining access to employment and the domesticity continued to bind them to certain rules and regulations that were rooted in the patriarchal framework. Her autobiography also indicates how she had to continue negotiating issues of sexual harassment and corruption at the workplace. At the first job itself, she was subjected to sexual harassment by the assist assistant surgeon Badrika Nath Mukherjee who was her superior. She frankly disclosed other compromises also that she had to make at her workplace. The most striking of one such example was the incident of a child of 11 years dying in the hospital after marital rape by her husband, which again reflected the infamous Fulmani Dasi case of 1890, which had sparked off a raging controversy over the minimum age of a girl wife for the consummation of marriage. The incident occurred after the passing of the Age of Consent Act of 1891, which had made it a criminal offence for a husband to have sexual intercourse with his child wife until she was 12 years of age. 
Hence, this incident was actually a criminal offence and should have rightly been a police case. However, Hemavati was forced to participate in a cover-up exercise that was carried out by the civil surgeon Dr. Kali Pado Gupta. So, therefore, uh, one can say that what was being said was not always being practiced. There were also a number of colonial interactions. She was a beneficiary of the move to induct women into medical schools and the entire move to insert Indian women into medical training at various levels. This was definitely a result of the action initiated by the Countess of Dufferin Fund from the 1880s onwards. Now, having gone through this autobiography, what emerges is that women cannot always be treated as passive subjects, as if it was only men who were making decisions on their behalf or who were starting reform movements to bring them out of clutches of darkness. There are four key aspects in her life which mark out her life as extraordinary. Firstly, she was a literate woman in an age when female literacy was a taboo. Secondly, she was a child widow who remarried with no family support at the age of 25. Thirdly, she went to great difficulty, she went through great difficulties and uh, dangers uh, and uh, despite them, her passion for learning did not die. And finally, she became a lady doctor and managed both uh, household as well as the public domain. And in all this, she displayed a female subjectivity which continued to be the driving force of her life. While doing so many different, while performing so many different roles uh, as a decision maker, she continued to prevail and the decision to convert from Hinduism to the reformist Brahmo Samaj religion which afforded women a higher social status and encouraged female education as well as widow remarriage was very important. Similarly, her decision to educate herself at the medical college and become a doctor. And even before these major decisions, her decision to move out of Banaras where she saw no career for herself played a very important role role. Haima Bhati displays a feminist perspective and critiqued prevailing gender inequalities in the upper caste society. The issue of child marriage and the dangers of marital rape that a minor wife was constantly subjected to are spelled out without any inhibition in her autobiography. She frankly discussed problems related with sexuality. She captured the psychological traumas of a child who was torn from her familiar surroundings and subjected to sexual assaults by middle-aged husbands, as well as the narrow escape she herself had from marital rape. So, therefore, having displayed such uh, confidence and uh, her conviction that whatever she had gone through must be written unabashedly and must see light of the day brings us uh, to, the, to a narrative which is not only talking about uh, a woman's aspiration, but it also captures the contemporary socio-political conditions, uh, the, the cultural mindset of people uh, and how this male-dominated society was gradually undergoing 
change as a result of impact of colonialism, reformism and later on nationalism. Thanks a lot.